Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 and AP English, the World of Ideas Lectures. We are in Unit 7 on Faith. This is Lecture Number 39, St. Matthew's, the Sermon on the Mount. We will be reading the 1611 King James Version of the Bible. Of course, you'll obviously recognize some of our comments right away from the Learn Strong Lecture in the Senior A folder on the 1611 King James Version of the Bible. Now, a good number of you have asked for me to provide a lecture on world religions and especially on Christianity and the Christian faith. Hey guys, this is not that lecture. We don't have the time here, and we are in fact just looking at a particular essay from World of Ideas so that we can continue to develop as writers. Having said that, however, we will make a couple of observations that will sound very similar to our previous two lectures from unit number seven. Our comments already on uh, the Buddha will come to mind immediately in this regard. Now, uh, we'll first of all point out that when we are studying religions, we are able to do it from two different perspectives. An apologetic approach to a religion is to ask what's right or what's wrong about the religion. A non-apologetic approach is to simply ask, what can I learn about this faith or this religion, the way people will practice this faith or this religion? Clearly that's our orientation here in 303. Following the great Houston Smith, his religions of the world, a whole chapter on Christianity, I certainly recommend it to you. One of the observations that Smith and many scholars of religion have pointed out is that Judaism will first of all exist, and then Christianity will be an extension of that, and then obviously Islam as well as the three monotheisms as often referred to. In the same way as Hinduism will give birth to Buddhism, and ultimately in China and Japan, Zen Buddhism. So the evolution of, a, of, of religious faith is a part of that conversation. Now, if you go back and you look at LearnStrong.net, our comments on St. Augustine, especially uh, his confessions, Augustine was not the first, but certainly one of the most important to point out that in the uh, Christian tradition, there's actually in the New Testament two different understandings of God, as referenced by two different phrases, God loves and God is love. Now the God loves is an easy understanding in terms of a word picture, assuming that you had a good father who, you know, is loving and kind to you, or you witnessed that somewhere else. You understand that word picture of a loving deity, a loving, a loving God. But what is the word picture that describes God is love? Give me that word picture. Well, St. Augustine was an influential theologian to point out that's a different understanding of God. God loves is a personal understanding of God. God is love is what we call transpersonal, right? That is to say, beyond this notion of the personal. Likewise as well, we should point out that Jews have their Bible that the Christians will later um, co-opt and call the Old Testament as opposed to the New Testament. We'll be looking, of course, at the very first uh, book of that New Testament. And, of course, that New Testament begins with four Gospels, the term meaning good news, and it, of course, is the four different renderings of the life of Jesus Christ. Okay? Of course, as well, we should point out that the moral code that is presented in the New Testament is in many ways encapsulated in the very verses we'll be looking at, the Sermon on the Mount. Now, why the, why the King James 11, 1611 version? Uh, well, Jacobus selects it because, of course, that's the beautiful poetry that we talk about in a Learn Strong lecture, and you can go and uh, take a look at that. Now, speaking of that, our assumptions in this lecture is that, of course, you have been following our stuff at Learn Strong, uh, Dot net in the AP folder, the, the World of Ideas folder, lectures 1 through 38. We assume that you are familiar with our learning theory and they desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. And of course, we do that in active reading by answering our three guiding questions. What does the text say? Level 1. What does the text mean? Level 2. 2A. Thebes messages in our big five. Epistemology, uh, ontology, psychology, sociology, theodicy. And then at level 2B, rhetoric, not what is said, but how it is said, 
And then finally, at level three, we'll ask, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? 3A to other titles that I'm familiar with, and of course, at 3B, relate to myself. And then finally, our hope is that you'll pick this material up and read it for yourself. I've had a few students who have pointed out, dude, I grew up going to Sunday school, and I actually read a bit of the Bible, and I probably have read this before earlier in my life. But I'm really honest, I'm looking at it now from a completely different kind of perspective, because I'm studying it as a work of literature as a, from its rhetorical perspectives. Now let's do some quick, brief background information. First of all, Matthew, a Levi believed to be the author of this text, and I say believed to be because, of course, disputed today is the very idea of where a text like the Gospel of Matthew actually comes from. Of course, within the text itself, at no point does it say, I, Matthew, am the one writing this. And in fact, when Matthew is himself is mentioned in the text of the Gospel of Matthew, he doesn't say I, he just says Matthew, right? Now, the dates according to Matthew, uh, uh, um, we believe, about A.D. 10 to A.D. 80. We think that the Gospel was composed around A.D. 70, although there's a bit of debate even about that. Probably written in Greek, although there's some debate that maybe it, it was written in Hebrew, although we don't have any extant copy of the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew. Often said that Matthew is the most Jewish of the four Gospels. Often there's quoting from the Jewish sources and the Jewish uh, texts, right? Um, Papias, in the second century, a bishop, is the one to have reportedly said that Matthew was the, in fact, writer of this text. Again, it's a subject of some debate. I want to turn to what Jacobus has to say about, um, uh, about the Gospel of Matthew on 590. He says, the Gospel of St. Matthew tells of the early life of Jesus, his activity in Galilee, including the Sermon on the Mount, which appears here, his activity in Jerusalem, his eventual crucifixion. Matthew emphasizes Jesus' power as healer, and of course the spiritual value of his message. Part of the Sermon on the Mount includes the Beatitudes, as they're referred to, that is to say, uh, Matthew 5, verses 1 through 13, nine blessings that Jesus offers the multitude. The Gospel of St. Luke, which is the third of the, th of the four Gospels, the third of the synoptic Gospels, as it's referred to, because they all kind of tell the, the basic, same basic stories, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 6, verses 20 through 23, includes four more Beatitudes, by the way. Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you that hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leave for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. These blessings indicate the spiritual comfort that Matthew and the disciples received from the teachings of Jesus. Now, Jacob finishes by pointing out the Sermon on the Mount goes beyond spiritual comfort, however, by offering a guide for a living as a Christian in it. Jesus discourses on the law itself, the power of anger, adultery, lawsuits, loving one's enemies, charity, prayer, fasting, heaven, God, as well as many other subjects. And in this regards, of course, some of this guidance is similar to the guidance that Buddha offers in his efforts to point the way to enlightenment, as we saw in our last lecture, right? Thus, the ser and, and we'll see this again in the next lecture, the Bhagavad Gita, to follow this lecture. Thus, the Sermon on the Mount offers followers of Jesus a pattern for faith and a prescription for moral behavior. Now, if we are talking the rhetoric of this passage, then this, without question, is, Jacobus argues, the most quoted of the four Gospels. Matthew, or whoever the writer was, is a very gifted literary individual, no question. Narration, obviously, is the structure, and the oral presentation, especially as it relates to aphorisms, will be a part of this one. And, of course, will want to be reminded that it was Mahatma Gandhi who said that the Sermon on the Mount is one of the most profound single texts in the history of all texts. With that in mind, let's turn now to this reading. And as I've said about prior readings, I wish I could just read every line of this in exegete with you, but we don't have the time. So let's go to work with it now. I'm going to work um, um, chapters and verses here, and we'll summarize at level one. Chapter four, verses 23 through 25, we're told, Followed by great crowds, Jesus travels in Galilee, healing the sick. Among the other things, of course, Jesus is reported to do is to be a healer, right? Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. He sits down on a mountain, and he begins to teach them, which is why we call this the Sermon on the Mount, right? Chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. He says, great rewards await those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, who long for righteousness, who show mercy, who are pure in heart, who make peace, and who suffer for the sake of Christ. 
verses 13 through 16 of chapter 5. He says, You are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Let your light shine as an example to others. Chapter 5, 17 through 20 verses. I have come to fulfill, he says, not to destroy established laws and prophecies. Those who wish to enter heaven must obey the law. Uh, um, uh, verses 21 through 26 of Matthew 5, he says, Avoid unjust anger. Seek forgiveness from those who you have wronged. Make peace with your adversaries. Failure to reconcile yourself with others will put you at risk of judgment. Verses 27 through 30 of chapter 5, To look lustfully at a woman is to commit adultery with her in your heart. Notice the assumption is apparently that the audience is primarily, if not all men, certainly mostly men, right? Um, if one part of your body causes you to sin, rid yourself of that part rather than put your whole body at risk. Chapter 5, 31, 32 verses, except in cases of fornication, divorce is wrong. Those who remarry after divorcing commit adultery. Chapter 5, verses 33 through 37, those who swear oaths come to evil. Instead of swearing oaths, simply say yes or no. And we, of course, in the American tradition, understand the power of the Quaker reading, right, of this. Of this. Chapter 5, verses 38 through 42, don't seek revenge. When people ask something of you, give them what they ask and more. Chapter 5, to finish chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, Imitate your Father in heaven by treating all people, even your enemies, with love. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Don't make a public show when you give alms. Those who give alms without show will be rewarded in heaven. This is that distinction which is sometimes made between appearing religious versus being spiritual. Go back to our lectures on Plato and the cave allegory, and we've had something to say about that. Chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. Pray privately without vain repetition. Acknowledge your Heavenly Father, ask for your daily needs for forgiveness as you forgive others, and for protection from temptation. Chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, likewise, fast or go without eating, privately, without outward show. Chapter 6, verses 19 through 23, don't store up your treasure on earth, but in heaven. Keep your eye focused only on good. That, that notion of controlling then the way you think and what you see, sounding, of course, very similar to what we studied with the Buddha already and soon what we will study with the Bhagavad Gita. Chapter 6, verses 24 through 34. No one can serve both God and worldly riches. Therefore, do not worry about bodily needs or the future. Just as your Heavenly Father cares for birds and flowers, He will care for you. And that's how chapter 6 ends. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, begins with judging. Don't judge or admonish others, lest the same be done to you. And of course, we have that famous bit of humor about an individual with a telephone pole laying across his eye, looking to try and take out a little tiny speck from the eye of another person. This, uh, this of course, is one of the great examples of humor in the Gospels, right? Uh, chapter 7, verses 7 through 12, ask for what you need, and your Father will give it to you. Chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, the wide path leads to destruction. Follow the narrow path which leads to life. Chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, shun false prophets, their wolves disguise the sheep. Avoid the corrupt tree which yields only bad fruit. Chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, not all who claim to know me will enter heaven. This is some of the exclusivity of the, of the Christian message here. Chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, whoever follows these teachings will thrive, whoever does not will perish. And then finally, verse 28 of chapter 7, we're told that the people were amazed by Jesus' teaching because he teaches as one having authority. Well, that's the Sermon on the Mount in summary at level 1. Let's now turn to levels 2 and 3. The big five at level 2a, what epistemologically is this text suggesting? Well, clearly calling into notions of absolute interpretations of the law a new understanding of the law. And to that degree, without question, this is the fallibilist uh, epistemological position. What one can know, that is to say, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong about this. That epistemological position, I think, is fundamental to reading Christ's new ideas. Ontologically, what does this text say? Well, of course, to be a child of God, all of us are. This text says a child of God means that one must love God because God loves that child, right? 
Psychologically, what's this text say? Well, fears can obviously keep us from our joy. Sociologically, what does this text say? We must show, obviously, mutual respect to others, to love all, even our enemies, right? And in terms of the question of theodicy and the origination of pain and suffering, we create, of course, this text says, most of our pain because of our worrying and our anxiety. That is to say, we have to learn to ask not why did this happen to me, but why did this happen for me? And to, of course, seek the narrow path as opposed to the um, largely open path, right? Two A messages, there are so many here, right? One obviously is don't worry, learn to trust God. That is to say, things are not always what they appear to be. And don't judge others. Worry more about yourself. The whole notion of, again, the, uh, you know, the, the, the telephone pull over the eye. Finally, at 2B, well, the aphorisms here are powerful. What was your favorite line and why? And, of course, the powerful word pictures we mentioned at, uh, at 7.30, the uh, humor, right, of the uh, telephone pull over, over your eye, right? At 3A, well, we've already studied the Buddha's teachings. Uh, notice all of the similarities, of course, many differences as well. We've mentioned St. Augustine in our Learn Strong lectures there, as well as Marcus Aurelius in our LearnStrong.net lectures. I want to throw out Jordan Peterson because so many of you are following his stuff and his Genesis lectures. In fact, Peterson does, a, I think, a pretty great job of talking about the power of the Sermon on the Mount when he lectures about the Tower of Babel and those stories on Genesis. And then, of course, we mentioned Houston Smith. Finally, it's 3B. Why do you think it is so hard, just personal now, why do you think it is so hard not to worry, to not have anxiety? What was a time that you judged and it hurt you. That is to say, you had the telephone pole over your eye trying to take out the speck of your, of your pal. And finally, why is waking up so hard to do, right? What, um, what, what for you makes that such a, a, a challenging thing? What concepts here do you find most valuable to you? We leave this study now and move on to the Bhagavad Gita. We'll continue our study in religious uh, faiths and the uh, brief passages shared by Jacobus. Thank you.